Antonio is ready to turn a dream into reality when excavation for Hemisphere began in February of 1967. Jesse Diego Yather takes a look at what went into building the fair. Where someday there would be a World's Fair, there was an old neighborhood. Substandard housing in the heart of downtown San Antonio, a few old homes of historical value, and numerous commercial buildings contributing to a general slum area. By declaring most of them substandard, millions in federal urban renewal money were used to buy and clear about 100 acres and to relocate with several hundred people who lived there. Olivia Valdez was one of many who believed it was for the good of the city, unlike some of her neighbors. No podíamos hacer nada. Muchas personas fueron a la corte, se pelearon, hubo mucho, mucho pleito porque pues no se querían mover y esto y lo otro. Pues nosotros pensamos. There was nothing we could do, ver. she says. Although many people went to court to put up a fight because, among other things, they didn't want to move. We did have some condemnation. There's no question about it. We went to court on some of the properties, but more times than not, it was about money than anything else. They felt that that all of a sudden their property was necessary and therefore they should get ten times what it was worth. There was only one actual eviction of a man named Frank Tudus, who it said never claimed the money he was given for his property. However, Olivia Valdez took the money she was offered for her three properties, and 20 years later proudly believes this is the pecan tree her husband planted in their backyard, which would become part of the U.S. Pavilion and later the federal courthouse. They also see traces of the old neighborhood, where the dry cleaners used to be, the neighbor lady's house who had all the dogs. About 30 structures were saved and restored, although many now are vacant. Others, like Kinky and Nando's Ice House, are gone, despite protests at the time, over its architectural value. And so is St. Michael's Church. I was really angry because they were going to knock down St. Michael's Church. Like so many others, the Esparzas had emotional ties to an area the government had labeled blighted slums. I guess everybody was really hurt because we grew up all together, you know, since we were small and, and just want somebody go one way and the other go the other way and not see them again. We'll soon shake your windows and rattle your walls for the times they are a-changing. From the rubble of old familiar slums reaching skyward is the symbol of achieved reality in this great community undertaking. The Tower of the Americas grows upward for San Antonio and all the world to see. A kid called it Daddy's Tower. <laughs> After all, architect Boone Powell had designed it. Here with his famed partner, O'Neill Ford, they stood next to the most costly version of the tower that actually began as more of a monument before evolving into what we see today. It'll remind San Antonians that they, that they built the hemisphere. It'll remind them of the kind of courage and the kind of ambition and, uh, and the kind of sheer determination to do something beyond what they had ever accomplished before. Of course, it wasn't without controversy about how to pay for it, who should own it, who should build it. In fact, Powell says a threatened lawsuit prompted them to start building it in the middle of the night. And from then on, they worked day and night. We could work all the hours that we could stand to try and get it ready for our opening day. It was really something. It was a great time. Sure-footed iron workers braved icy conditions and seemingly relentless winds to help build what would become at 750 feet San Antonio's tallest structure. Not everybody's an iron worker, let, let me put it to you, just that's why it's, so, it's a few of us. And I mean, it's just every day you get paid for what you do. This man even gave of his own flesh and blood while working on a pump. I had my hand trying to find a fitting up there, and one of the men on the job hit the button and slapped my finger off. Already delayed by the onslaught of Hurricane Beulah, another setback came when the top house fell 10 inches when several jack rods that had been used to raise it snapped. Cranes had to be brought in from all over the state to support it while drill stems were put in place to hoist the top house upwards. Competing with the tower as an architectural curiosity was the Hilton Palacio del Rio. Where there had been a skid row, concrete modular construction was being used for the first time. Molly and Bartel Zachary joined the hotel representatives to make hospitality history 
by being the first people ever to ride their room into a hotel. Each of the rooms, already furnished so completely they had Gideon Bibles in them, was being stacked like building blocks. The Hilton became the first of several hotels that would be built near the convention center that was going up and the San Antonio River that was being extended. On the hemisphere grounds, construction had reached a feverish level. And yes, the work would continue even after Hemisphere 68 had opened. The tower went up an average of 10 feet a day. And remarkably, according to the official guidebook, when the Tower of the Americas was completed, it was only three-eighths of an inch off-center. Next, Hemisphere 68 becomes a reality.